so it's nice to, to be here with you guys. Uh, I think for us, before we start talking about micro budget and really what that entails, I think uh, considering your history and your experience, I think the first thing we really have to discuss is how that sense of community where you came from really informed your work. So, um, one, excited to be here. I noticed we have uh, a Miami contingent. <laughs> um, I'll start for, for a minute. Because I want to start with... Um, Your name starts with A. <laughs> so my, Miami uh, was a big part um, of our lives, obviously, but also of our work. And uh, I think for me, it goes back to uh, where I went to high school. Uh, it's a, a visual and performing art magnet program called New World School of the Arts. Um, and Terrell had actually gone to the same program, but several years ahead of me. And Terrell uh, was someone we all I knew about, uh, even when he wasn't at the school, because of the work that he'd done there. And... Um, I kind of want to pivot to this this question because when we were in Miami, we first heard about you. It was a lot of the influence of, of like you were writing stories about home. Um, and when I graduated uh, film school, I came back to Miami and helped start an organization called the Borscht Film Festival, which um, briefly a collective of filmmakers making films by Miami for Miami about Miami. And a lot of that was inspired by Terrell's emphasis on community and and telling stories in, in sort of to your audience, your core audience of the people you, you know, the people you live with, the people you grew up with, uh, and telling stories of home. So with that, I want to pivot to you and ask sort of where that came from for you in the first place. That's interesting and weird that you would do that. Um, <laughs> um, because you were like doing fine and then now you're just going to make me talk. Um, <clears throat> hi, I'm Terrell. I'm the shy one. Uh, and you know, what was all, what is interesting about Miami and, and I think, what is um, what is uh, hard to talk about without getting frustrated and upset is that um, Miami doesn't sell its best part of it, which is a weird thing to say because again it puts in sort of a capitalistic bent or economic bent on or or commodi uh, making commodity of what a city or culture has. At the same time, we are a city that is steeped in tourism. We're constantly inviting folk in to enjoy the beach. And uh, sometimes what will happen is someone will stumble into the fact that we have the largest Haitian community outside of Haiti. Somebody will stumble onto the fact that we have, you know, some of the some of the newest and most innovative Cuban art outside of Cuba. Some of the somebody will stumble on the fact that we have more Venezuelan, you know what I mean? Like in in this area that is called Miami Dade, there's so much happening. We have um, a history of black pe of black people and black experience in Miami that goes back to the founding of the city and to you know the 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 founding of the state, right? Um, there are stories about Osceola and the Seminoles hiding black slaves from Georgia in Miami or in Miami adjacent um, from, during the Civil War, and this kind of the, the kind of history, the kind of culture that grew out of that, the fact that we have a word called Seminola, which means uh, uh, black and uh, Seminole descent. Um, there's a whole area in Little and uh, and uh, in Hialeah called Seminola that nobody knows that that's why that has that name. I mean, it's just those things about our city are so beautiful and so amazing, and those are not the things that we put on the moniker to say come to, to our city for. And so for me, as a kid growing up, it was astonishing to me that nobody thought these stories were worth anything, um, that they were invitations into a culture and an understanding that was both at once profound but unique. Right? You and our, our relationship, our friendship, the ability, the conversations that we have had, um, our conversations with Lucas, who was also uh, one of the founders of Borscht. I mean, I would just sit there and marvel at, at how much shared history we have and how if we grew up in Ohio, that wouldn't be the same. Like our economic lines would tie us in a way that we would never have such crossover. And yet, you know what I mean? And yet we did, and yet we had similar experiences. You grew up without air conditioning, I grew up without air conditioning. I mean, like, there are things that we could have conversations about that, that, that blurred lines in many ways. And I just always found that interesting and felt like if I could get folk in the homestead to really literal and figurative, right? Um, uh, to, to investigate that and to invest back into that, then communities wouldn't dry up overnight. Because that's the terrifying thing. That's the thing that haunts, I think, artists my, like myself and yourself, is that at some day we're going to wake up and all of it, well, we already know it's sinking. 
So we got 20 years before we have to like relocate more inland. And I mean, it's funny, but it's true, right? Like we already know that we got like 20 more years before we got to be 10 feet, 12 feet, 15 feet, two miles back in, right? And then, um, and then after that, we were wondering like in the night, which area is going to be gentrified so much that it, we never know the history that went on there. I mean, we've already lost Overtown, right? Which used to be the Harlem of, South, of uh, Florida, of Miami. Um, and all of the black arts and history that's in it, we've already pretty much lost it. And no one's telling that story. And so if we don't tell it, and then the last thing I'll say, because I've now talked for 30 minutes, um, <laughs> the, is that, the, um, that as, I've go, as I've had to leave Miami to, to make more work, I have learned that there's something very true about the way in which a community tells its stories. Um, there, is a, there, there is a health check you can tell by, if you go to a neighborhood and ask somebody, tell me about your neighborhood, just tell me the story of it. Whatever that person holds, that person who is from that place, tells that narrative that that community believes about itself is a health inspection of just how long that neighborhood's gonna survive. It's the reason why there's certain neighborhoods and, and places that we just, that are, that are iconic across the world because that neighborhood has a story about itself, believes in its history and, re and, and retains its own narrative. And if I could get pockets of Miami to retain its own narrative and, and, and invest in the health of its, its, uh, its narrative to the world, then we, then we can, come, then we can you know, do the things that you know, some folk, the, the carpetbaggers come in and say, yeah, let's build a, a studio down here. Sure, you can build a studio, but not until you get the local folk to really, because who's gonna man this, your studio? You gonna bust everybody in? It's expensive to live in Miami, right? So if everybody's ex living off of no money to come do this film in Miami, right? And then having to live here and eat here, then what? Then they're not making any money, so they don't wanna be here, right? So you've got, it's gotta be local. You've gotta get the locals involved. They've gotta be trained um, or, or have the skill set and want to engage Otherwise, you have no, the, the, economic, the economics around filmmaking and television making and art making in general, they disappear. So 14-year-old me heard that <laughs> and, then, and then spent the next 20 years focused on trying to make that real. Uh, well said. Um, but I want to flag one super, super nerdy Eastern, uh, Easter egg. Um, he mentioned Ohio, and there's uh, Miami, Ohio is a city. And it has been a, a running joke that we would eventually one day do like a Miami, Ohio festival, but like sneak there and, and just like transplant a palm tree and be like, hey, we're here. Um, so I thought that was hilarious. Uh, you guys. <laughs> um, no shade to Miami, Ohio. No, I'm sure it's lovely. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, well, okay, so, so that idea of, of pockets in the community that, that can tell their own narrative was a thing that, ob that obsessed us as filmmakers because we realized, um, well, actually, let me pivot from that. I want to, how many of you live in New York or have been, in, been to New York? How many of you have seen a movie set in New York, heard a song about New York, and heard someone at some point say New York is the best city on earth? Uh, what, so Terrell was talking about this kind of stuff about Miami and how Miami has all these things, and then we realized, like, we actually went to New York for the first time, and you realize, like, oh, they say all that stuff about New York, but none of it is true. <laughs> or some of it's true, but it's not true as much as they say it's true. And, like, you don't have any grass. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, like low-key, it's great. Like, and even, you know, even when you go to L.A. for the first time, you're like, these places are amazing, and, they're, and those moments of amazing that are in the movies or in the songs are, are amazing, right? And you run in, you do have, there are moments that are only, you only could happen in New York City. But they happen other places, right? Like, and I think I think when we were, we, it's one of the things that I think marveled us about Moonlight was that Barry really got because only a, only a homeboy could get that, right? Barry and James got that. Like, you can have the shittiest day. Excuse my French. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> shittiest day um, in Miami, and like you know, and come home to uh, uh, you know the bear that is your life. And the birds are going to continue to sing. Like the palm trees are going to continue to sway. The, the mango uh, jasmine in the air is going, I mean, we have these things called four o'clock. You have them too, I'm sure, but they like bloom at four o'clock. There's like, you smell them. There's nothing you can do to stop nature happening in Miami sometimes. And it's terrifying because that, it makes you go, oh yeah, my life is one way, but like the world is happening. And there's a difference in, in that, that socially conditions you to be a little different. 
you socially learn like, oh, a hurricane's coming. There isn't anything I can really do, say board up these windows as best I can and pray for the best, right? And that's a different kind of mentality than an earthquake mentality. That's a different kind of mentality than a snowstorm mentality. Like it's just, and to be able to capture that, be able to put it down is, is, is necessary for us. But I think again, it goes into it goes into we we have to find economic models to to look at that because what happens is we get a we we were lucky because that our one of the things that Andrew's not telling you is that the reason why our school thrived for the first thirty years it was it's a fairly young uh, school modeled off of uh, 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 New York's LaGuardia PA school, performing arts school and. Uh, Richard Klein, who came down to be the first principal of the school, um, came from PA, came from LaGuardia, and 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 they started this program with um, a lot of students from the north at Northwestern, which is the school Barry Jenkins went to, and the south, which and which Miami Dade, and they partnered to make this happen. Now, how did they? Who were the instructors that they got? Well, it just happened that there were a whole bunch of Broadway people retiring to Florida. And so they got Paula Wayne Shelley, who was the first woman, uh, the first white woman on uh, Broadway stage to kiss a black man with Sammy Davis Jr. and Golden Boy to lead their music theater program. They got, I mean, they got dancers. They got uh, Ho uh, Jose Limon's uh, top dancers. They've got Alvin Ailey dancers. They got Graham dancers to come. They were all retiring around this time and they needed a place to sort of cool. And it was great. The weather was nice. It was good and flat. Right. So you and so they got they came there and they taught these students for the next 20 to 30 years. We are at another uh, impasse in our community because we can't get us to come back. Me and Andrew still working. <laughs> so we can't. It's hard to come home. It's hard. I was like, Andrew, come on, let's go down. We'll start a studio. We'll do it. Marco, I try to get Marco Ramirez. Marco, we'll, we'll all go down. We'll just do it. Marco's like, hey, I work for Marvel. <laughs> I'm not going back to Miami anytime soon. <laughs> I, I can't, right? And so we have to look at the economics behind it because otherwise we, we, we look at stop, we look out extinguishing uh, great careers who are, um, sadly, there are, are stunning artists from Miami who can't sustain themselves there. Sorry, you oh, should yeah, have No, no. No, no, it, it's flowing. <laughs> I know, I, what, I, what I wanted, what I wanted to, out of the way. I wanted to point out, um, so in, in relation to, specific, to micro budget filmmaking, what's so, what's so interesting to me about this conversation, it's a conversation we've been having for years, but is how much of it comes back to um, understanding and appreciating where we're coming from. It, what it did is it gave, us, it, it, it gave us a purpose when we were telling our stories. We felt like we're not just telling a movie because I want to tell a movie, we're telling a movie because someone needs to know about this. There was an urgency to why we were doing it, and it was an urgency we created, and what we felt look, we're Miami storytellers. This is what we do. I could go to New York, and then I'm a Miami storyteller in New York. New York doesn't need another, like, L.A. didn't need another film student with dreams, right? So I didn't go to L.A. Uh, for the first 12 years of my career. Um, but Miami needed someone to tell these stories, so it felt like, oh, I can be a part of that. And the idea that we could be motivated um, by a bigger purpose and realizing that, like, I think when you make a certain type of movie, when you're making... Um, you know, a thriller. You're looking for people who like thrillers. When you make a, a horror movie, you're looking for people who like horror movies. When you're making a movie about your place, your audience are the people who live there. Mm -hmm. And that's very different because the people in the room don't look like the same kind of people. It's not like, oh, your movie's cool for 20-somethings. It's like, no, your movie's cool for anyone who lives within Miami-Dade County. Like, that is a massive cross-section of people. Mm -hmm. But if the neighbor, if the, you your house became the location you're going to go, which means, you know, the mother of five uh, who never goes to the movies is going to be there. And then the guy who lives down the street, and then the kid who helped PA, and then the other guy who catered. Like you bring in your community, you're building something. Your your films uh, contribute to the building of a community, mm -hmm. and when you build a community, the community becomes self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. So by by thinking about uh, the city and what the city meant, and thinking about um, the stories that are that other people are telling about us, and us collectively as as Miami, uh, gave us a chance. It gave us a villain, frankly. It was like we could fight this narrative of Miami. It's great for beaches, like. Ace Ventura, Dexter, like all these things come in and they're mostly white dudes wearing Hawaiian t-shirts solving murders, right? And like, <laughs> that's not the life I lived in Miami. Um, there was that one murder that you solved. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, I think it's really that you don't have any Hawaiian shirts. I, I actually own a number of Hawaiian shirts. Um, I don't think you've spent <laughs> enough time with him recently. Oh, okay. But um, 
in the world. There you go. <laughs> Tommy Baham all the way. Um, but uh, the the uh, it gave us it gave us something to to rally around. It gave us something bigger than the budget of our movie or the actor that was in it. It was like it doesn't really matter. Did it take place in in Kendall? Did it take place in downtown Miami? Did it take place where I went to high school? Did it take place in that building I went to that one time that thing happened? Mm -hmm. And um, and I to to. I'm going to make a big leap here, but I'm going to talk about Moonlight for a second, where Barry, uh, one of the things Barry did so well in that movie was actively seek out locations that carried the history of Miami within it. Mm -hmm. So there's a scene on the film where uh, Mahershala and uh, Alex are having a conversation. They're on the beach, and the conversation is, is one, it's it verbatim from Terrell's original uh, story, and the idea of where um, he's talking about race in Cuba, and he's like, a lot of black folks in Cuba, but you wouldn't know that from here, which on its own is a is a novel we can unpack, but um, but that beach, Virginia Key Beach, was the segregated beach, and up until the 80s, that was the beach where if you were from Liberty City, that's the beach you went to. Yeah. So the fact that the movie was, that wasn't something that the movie broadcast, but the fact that it was set in that location tied in the history of Miami into that moment. It wasn't relevant to the, to the uh, superficial reading of the movie, but to tie that movie in, that story into the narrative of Miami as a city, as a place, that's 100% the correct answer. That's the only location that could have been. But um, for the people, for example, like me and the, like most of the audience probably who haven't spent a lot of time in Miami and are not familiar with the history, don't you feel that they can sense this? Like this truth that you're saying that it was in the script and in the production and in Barry's work, it comes out. And that humanity that is what I think made the film speak to the whole world you know like while it's a very specific to a certain community there's such a universe universality to it that i think that then that's why it's worth getting so specific and so like i'd love to hear like how you've thought about because i assume and i guess it's another question but i assume like when you were thinking about moonlight because it was a smaller budget you guys were you guys were just concentrating on that story, but you, were you guys ever thinking about the wider audience and how this was translating outside of people from Miami? And Well, I think th there's two things about that. I mean, one, it, you, at some point, we need to grab Barry and have a conversation with him because um, a, lot of what, a lot of what we did, um, and rightfully so, so I'll have to back up a bit which is, and tell you some of the boring stuff about Moonlight, right? So in Moonlight, Black Boys with Look Blue was a sort of, is the first... Uh, screenplay I've ever written um, and as Barry will tell you it's, it's not the greatest screenplay <laughs> right? uh, which is fine it's fine I wrote it when I was 23 you know I wasn't even 23 I was 22 um, I, I was 22 and um, the work that went on into it was preserving what a 22 year old's grief really looked like um, and that took a grown man um, and a, but also a person from Miami because I, the script in Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue a number of, a couple of times was on the slate to be made. Uh, we were going, I was in Chicago at the time and graduating from undergrad, and so there was a bunch of friends that I had who were also, again, because Chicago has a thriving arts community, got a hold of that script and was like, we're going to film it here. And I was like, maybe? They were like, yeah, we'll totally, we'll use the show. Like, everything was fine until they told me they were going to use the beach at, at the lake. And I was like, <laughs> nah, B, nah. <laughs> It ain't the same. Like it's not like, and they're like, no, it's the sand, it's the water, it'll be fine. There'll be moon. They'll be, I was like, yeah, mm, nah. Mm. It's like, it's just, it's not the same. There is something different to it. I can't. It's ineffable. I can't pronounce it. I can't tell you what it is. But I can't. I can't put my finger on it. But it's different, right? And, and how did that? I mean, I don't know if you know, but how how did that affect the budget when it was time to make that? Like to be able to say, you know, it, because in m micro budget filmmaking, mm -hmm. you have to have a certain flexibility in general, yeah. right? Um, you have to work I, with what you have, I, I guess, but well, maybe I, not. I have a, I have a, there's a bigger picture I want to say, but to directly answer that, there was a, a, a moment with, uh, Barry and I did a short film, um, called Chlorophyll, Chlorophyll. before, uh, Moonlight happened. And there was a moment on Chlorophyll where, which was a, a $3,000 short film. Uh, Barry got 25 minutes out of that $3,000 and that included the plane ticket from San Francisco to Miami. So we had like $2,000 to make the short. There were four crew members. And there was a moment on the movie where I'd set up this location. I'm trying to impress Barry Jenkins. Barry Jenkins had, um, at this point, was someone that I was, I was actively trying to to bring to Miami to do a bigger project. Mm -hmm. That project, you know, you heard about that one. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> but so at this point, I'm really trying to impress him. And uh, he arrives. We're heading to a location when the location calls us and says, "Yeah, we're definitely not letting you come in here." Um, 
so the whole thing is like falling apart and like, well, this is a terrible first impression. And Barry stops and says, listen, this is an independent film. We're just going to be fluid. And then he just floated around doing the things he had to do. He was just like, oh, let's change that. Make it here. This will work. We'll do it out there. And that, that willingness and ability to be flexible shows up again on Moonlight, specifically on that scene, mm-hmm. uh, on that beach, because that's when the baptism scene happens where Mahershala takes him swimming. Water. And the idea was, I think we had six hours to film that, and um, there was a, a storm coming. Someone looks out and says, "Hey, there's a like, you got 45 minutes, Barry." Before the sun gets here. Before That's the it. Sun's gone. But, so, but there wasn't, but but you're still sharks. able to be specific in terms of it had to be no, no, that there location. Were sharks, right? There were sharks in the water, and there was you can't put Alex in the water because there he looks like a little baby seal. So, <laughs> <laughs> real life. He was a lot younger. Uh, he he does not look like a baby seal anymore. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I think but, we all—I think we all look like baby seals at that time of day. So. But, uh, but, but that willingness and ability to be flexible changed the way Barry was thinking of shooting the scene. Yeah. Changed the way he was trying to do it. But what he understood was what the scene was about, and that allowed him to be flexible with everything else. But the question about location—I um, want to pivot away a little bit and say how I interpreted uh, how through Borscht and through the films and products I've done. Maybe how I interpreted the, the necessity of location, and it allowed us to speak to a specific community. And I think. When you have like die-hard fans who are just gonzo over a thing, you will convert other fans. So it's I think people didn't see the movie and immediately pick up on what we were feeling. They saw the response to the movie, picked up on that, then saw the movie and brought that energy into it. Sure, but I also but to your point, I think I think also uh, from again Andrew and I are talking often. Andrew's the, Andrew's the money guy, and I talked to him <laughs> and, I, and I well in the, in the sense of like. I get numbers, I get them enough, but to know that I can't do something, <laughs> like I'll go, oh, we can't do that, and then I'll go, okay, I'll go find us the other four thousand dollars we need to do it. But like at the end of the day, there's, it, it's only, it's we only, ch- or we try only to chase after the thing that is the most, most authentic, right? And, and because exactly what you're saying, at the end of the day, sure, you don't know what this relic means to me. You don't know, you don't know what the pier at South Point means to us. But it's but the language of it is going to communicate something to me emotionally that will allow me to continue to run after it over and over again. The symbols may not always add up to you. That's I mean there, we can see tons of art that has great symbolism in it that means something very specific to a community. But you but the again the the aura around it and I'm not trying to sound mumbo jumbo about it but the vibe of it will translate. That's what film is powerful in that way. It can pick it up. Um, and it does translate. It just do, it has a kind of bloke. Now, no, would anybody in this room know that Crandon Park or Virginia Key uh, was the first not segregated or made for black colored only beach? No, probably not unless they wanted to do some research. I mean, you folks might know um, the good old Miami contingent. But 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 outside of that, do you know that something else holy is happening in that place? Yes, because it's being tra- the it's coming through the actors. It's coming through the person who's holding the camera. It's holding. It's coming through the director who's directing this. There's something in the space that's making it work. Um, and so, when you're on a micro budget, when you don't have enough to do, you go, okay, where am I going to get the most wattage? Right. Where am I going to go that's going to give me of not just the vibe I need for this scene, but to carry past that into a sort of universality. And so, that, and so you've got to look at it. And that's, that's essential, to, in my take, about when you, when you are on a micro budget. And, and, but like there, so the sense of compromising, there, but there is, from what you were saying, though, there are certain things where you will not compromise. And when do you know when that is? Is it when it's affecting character or the story or just like the sense of the truth? What's, because micro budgeting, you, there's a lot of compromise. And yeah, I, again, I, I mean, you, you <laughs> uh, the thing that you're after is sometimes not easily translated, right? right? You, ha- you have to know what your North Star is. And for me, m- making Moonlight um, a purely Miami story was always at its forefront. I, I always knew I could not tell that story anywhere else. If I did, I would be lying about certain things. For example... One of the things that Barry talks about often that I'm dealing with currently is the way in which people reacted to poverty below the Mason-Dixon line slash below the Broward County line. When people saw the projects in which Chiron lived, often they kept saying to us, it's so beautiful. They're not doing that bad. Did you guys, are you guys making this light, like are you making this pink more pink? Are you making this blue more blue? I mean, I, I'm not making these questions up, and I'm clear. And I'm again when I'm shooting the, the television show that I'm shooting now in Florida, and and using the same colors on the projects that I grew up on, 
I have had people say to me, they don't look that bad off. They're palm trees. They're th- and so, so I say that to say, because you haven't been fed what poverty lo- or seen what poverty looks like to us and feels like and, and experienced it, we, you, all you know is the Marcy Projects. So I could have easily set this in, you know, East New York. And let and allowed a filmmaker to, to to take and pull, and they could they're short in 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 Long Island that they could have gone to, they could have had that kiss there, their school. But the the difference and the nuance of it is so it it, it, it is such a character that it you 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 snatch some of the breath out of the film, and so for us that was a north star. But that doesn't mean necessarily that every every project has to be you know, made in Miami about Miami. But for us, it was such a part of the lexicon of the world. We knew that you hadn't seen uh, a project with a courtyard that green before. We knew it. We knew it in making it. I want to point out the edit too, that you, look, you, you could have shot it in New York, you could have set it there and found, but then what you would have done is just told a version of the story we've already heard before. And the fact that you never heard it in Miami, you never heard it, like one of the things that, that made me so committed to, to, to helping the thing get made was that... Um, I wanted to know more about the city I lived in because I grew up in a very different part of Miami and Liberty City was a neighborhood that I was aware of. Um, but when I like when I grew up, uh, when I was born a couple years, I was a small child, but there was a race riot in Liberty City that meant when I grew up, I, it was a place I was not supposed to go. Mm-hmm. That was the thing I knew. And then I, I grew up and 20 years passed and I was still had this like, well, I'm not supposed to go there. there bad things happened 20 years ago that uh, I don't know anything about. And I live in Miami. I love the city. I've been working in Miami forever. How come I don't know more about the city? Where's the story that happens here? Setting in New York isn't what I'm interested in. I don't want to tell a story about New York. I don't care about New York. I want to know what's happening in Miami. You care about New York. <laughs> I mean, I have, I have very mixed feelings about New York. Sure. But, uh, but, um, That's a little bad. But, but at the time, I really wanted to hear Miami stories because I wanted to understand the place I lived in better. And uh, hearing the way Terrell had grown up and knowing that we had so many touch points, but we had so many other areas where I, I was just completely unaware. So the opportunity to film in, um, in like in, in the neighborhood, but but um, to live in that world for a minute, because that world includes it's not just Liberty City. The world includes Miami Beach. That world includes all these other things that we cross over. It includes the high school we went to, mm-hmm. um, which is not featured in the movie or a part of the, that movie's narrative. But um, but. That's what motivated it more than like can I get out the money on it? Like one of the reasons the budget on that movie was so low is because we insisted on shooting in Miami. They were like, well, there's no incentive there, so you can't get this kind of money back, and you can't do these things. So can you work with this? Okay, if they'd given us more, we would have taken it. <laughs> like we didn't choose that that number. We that's what we got. Um, so so I feel like. But you take the you take the hit c- again because. Uh, again, going back to your point about choices, those choices that you have to make when you don't, when you, when your budget is, is shifting or changing, or they're pulling it out from under you, um, it, is that again, once you, once it starts showing up in the dailies, folks go, what? Whoa! How did you get that light? Well, I can't. <laughs> I certainly can't afford it. You know what I mean? You, you know where you're shooting better than the person who is probably bankrolling your shot. And that you and that you can say, I know this library looks like this at four o'clock in the afternoon. I know the lions in front catch this light in this way, so I'm gonna catch it. And I don't now have I now I don't have to pay a grip to come, or I don't have to pay a production designer to come in and build the thing. Now I've saved the money to do it, but I've also got the thing. And that kind of intimate knowledge, you can't. I mean, that's the that's the sort of um, the secret weapon in a way. Um, it also leads to pretty interesting films because again, it's the, it's how your eye. It's the democratic way of making film in a way because it makes your eye the way in which we we invest in the world, and the way you you know the way you see the gate, the outside in front of your school is not the way the other kids do, and we want and that's and that's important. That's always been important to me. And because you raised a, a topic earlier about your colleague who is working for Marvel, for example, you know, and as your. <laughs> Who's no longer working. Okay, well, maybe it didn't work out. But the I point... No, out. it worked out really well. Oh, yeah. really well. <laughs> I don't know. He did okay. okay. Great. Yeah. But, but anyway, my point is that, like, as your careers have progressed, right, and you won an Oscar, and there's so many more opportunities now ahead of you, and you could conceivably working for a $100 million movie in these big films. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very good agent, I'm... You think. Oh, dope. Agent <laughs> Yeah. No, but... 
No, I know you're being humble, but th- you have oh, a lot uh, more opportunities than you used to. Like, probably you could work, you could sit and you could write a screenplay with a lot bigger budget and more opportunities. There's more, you know, th- people will sit and really, r- a lot of people will read it who otherwise you didn't have access to previously. And and so my point is just that, are you still drawn to those? St- so almost like the idea of maybe making more films lower budget, not necessarily maybe a micro budget, but a smaller budget, um, does that still entice you in terms of, because then you are able, you have the freedom to tell these stories that you wouldn't otherwise have in a bigger budget. So how do you kind of balance that out in terms of thinking of a broader thing, but coming back to Miami? and Because you did come back to Miami from what you're saying, right? You have the TV show, and we and I'm sure you have a better budget, it. right? Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's yeah. it's a balance. If the, if the question is, like, okay, you have all this, suddenly new opportunities are open to you. How do you stay true to the thing that got you there? Are you still interested well, in? Yeah, it's, yeah it, I don't think you have to be true to it. I don't think it's something that, like, but it's more of a desire than, like, a demand, well, like, a, you know. Well, look, I never got, I got, I, I was born and raised poor, <laughs> right? So, of course, there's always moments where I'm like, cool, can I make life-changing money off of doing that one thing? Sure, and when that moment comes, you best believe I'll do it. Meantime, in the Hall of Justice, um, I, you know, making Moonlight wasn't that thing. Like Barry and I were not going, were not sitting around. Barry, I, Andrew, a- it took Andrew coercing Barry, being like, "Just read the script, fam." Like for about three years, and then like we get an email on my birthday in like the 2003. I don't even remember when it was. It was like it was literally on my birthday, being like, "Cool, I read the script. I got some notes." And like that's how it's. But like. We none of us were sitting in a room thinking like we're going to now do the life changing money thing. Now I will, like I said, that moment may come and we, I will be like, hey girl, when she gets here. <laughs> um, but in the mean t- in the meantime, and again, all the projects that we've done after that have always been about the the excavating what Andrew was talking about in terms of like what who who we are, and and so for me, I take the times that I can to move out of the way. Because I know that there are other storytellers who want to do that and try to pump back into the economic system so that, again, no, I'm not, I don't think I've invested into a $2 million movie. But, you know, a movie by an artist from Miami we just did with a, uh, a director that we really love and um, a writer who we really care about and an actor, actress who we really love. And we just sort of put money into it and went, cool, let's make it. Right. Because, again, here's another story that we don't hear about that's happening in Miami or could happen in Miami or comes from Miami. And and we really want to see how it, it how it works. I think we, I think when we start chasing the idea that this is that this is that micro that like fix fixing us on a micro budget or any budget is the thing to keep us free is how they get us. Right. right. That's I think that's how the system gets us. Yeah. It's like at the look at the project. What does the project need? If if you're looking at something and you're like, you yeah, actually, in order to realize this truly and fully, I'm gonna need that big Marvel money. Then you go over there and you say, that's what that is. If you look at something and go, no, I can shoot this. I got five dollars in my pocket. I'm gonna get my phone out and I'm gonna do it right now. You go, cool, do it, right? But like you cannot, you cannot sort of, or you can, you can totally do it. But I I think that if you start looking at the budget of the thing first and determining whether or not that's going to allow you the freedom and the ability to make it uh, work, that's how the system limits you. So how, how, so I, I think, you know, as an example, how did you come, ab- how did uh, High Flying Bird come about? Again, one of those moments where people were sitting in, a, sitting in a room having a conversation about something they thought was important. And yeah, I mean, literally, I, I had a. It was Stephen's wife's birthday, and he was like, "Come on over to, to have a drink." And I came over. Him and Andre had been having a conversation about uh, about sports, about black players and black athletes. Um, they were like, "What do you think?" I was like, "This is an amazing conversation that we're having because I've been thinking about this in terms of my own practice and industry. Um, I, I'm excited to understand more about it." Let's keep having a conversation, and that, and then, and and again, at no point were we like, oh yeah, so we're gonna budget it this way, and it'll be for these folks, and then we'll do these. It was always like, we'll make the thing, we'll see what we have, and we'll, and then we will go, we'll go from there. And I think again, that allowed us to look at the project and say what kind of freedom we had. Now, Stephen, of course, has connections and places, and he could have easily gone. This is the way we'll make this, and st- put a stamp on it, gone out, but. Here was here again was a moment where Andre Holland, who is a, a, a newer executive producer, but producer nonetheless, is going. I, I just want to keep the conversation real and palpable. 
Uh, uh, there are two things I want to follow up on on that. The first one was the inside out process of that versus the outside in process. Uh, for me, micro budget is always about the inside process. It's like you start with what you have and build out. Uh, the the lower budget independent filmmaking way is always like I need this. Let's go get it. Uh, and I feel like that's limiting. That's where where you're limited by what you can get. And then oh, I would only make a movie if only I had the thing that I don't have. Well, then don't make that movie. Make the movie you can make with the thing you have. Because mm -hmm. m the movie you make is better than the one that you really want to make but can't. Because uh, that one doesn't exist. Um, and, and then the, the point about uh, how do you sort of come back to Miami, it's like, it, to, to Terrell's point, part of the idea that um, that now, okay, so now I have more opportunities than I had before that have taken me out of Miami. Um, how do I stay involved in Miami as well? There are filmmakers we can support. Uh, and one of the things is um, I just helped launch a program with the Art Center South Florida, which is a, a, an organization in Miami that's supporting artists through grants and, and residencies. And we have a micro-budget film residency. called It's a South Florida film year residency. It's a $50,000 grant to make the movie all in. It's not seed money. You don't get finishing funds. It's 50 grand, finish the movie. And that's to find local filmmakers in Miami who are able to work inside out. This is what I have, how to tell a story at home with these resources. Uh, so I can help mentor them and take them through. I don't need to necessarily go through that again. I did it. It worked. I want to keep going. Uh, but if I can keep uh, the pipeline and, and sort of keep the path open, this is a, a strange metaphor, and I'm going to make it. I apologize. But the thing about Miami as a city that I really love is that Miami didn't make sense to me conceptually until I saw it as um, it's really a frontier town on the edge of a swamp. Mm -hmm. And only when you like recognize that everything else makes sense, you're like, oh, that's why it functions this way. It's just a bunch of lunatics who've who've carved out a corner, uh, and are here fighting off the alligators. Like, oh, we have nice things, but that's a that's an illusion. Total. Um, but so here I'm the guy with the machete cutting through the mangroves, and and that's the path. Like it, you have to keep the path moving, otherwise it grows over. Yeah. So if we can keep, build that pipeline and bring more people and and uh, help the local filmmakers who are already doing work, just help them do what they're doing. They don't have to do what I want. They have to do what they want. But this is the path that I carve. You can, I can help you here if you're interested. Yeah, every, everyone in Miami is a startup, right? Like everyone else is like, I'm the first to do this thing and like it's amazing and then I'm going to go off. The, like everybody's at the new frontier. You're absolutely right. And it, it happens so often that we, we I mean, there was only, there's only been a few studies where uh, I think that the Miami Herald clocked the sort of brain drain in Miami. And more often than not, it was artists of color who left and didn't come back? Like we, like we could not, we could not retain, like maintain them because everybody thought I'm special. I got this thing. I'm gonna go off, and then they go to Atlanta, and they're like, oh, and they go to New York, and they're like, ah, yeah, uh, yeah, not special. It's just, uh, just there. You know what I mean? And it's like, and so, and that's not. There's nothing wrong with going to a place and finding that there are other people like you doing the thing that you do. But it is when you're so far from home, and your and your and your your sasson, your your aesthetic. Is, is different. Like, you don't have a community to go, oh, yeah, remember lunch like that? Yeah. Or the like, we had to explain the spill out so many times. <laughs> like, the spill out area in Moonlight where, they, where he goes out and he has the fight. Who, who didn't see Moonlight? I don't want to spoil it for you. There's a <laughs> kid's fight and they go out to the spill out area. And, like, but the, the spill out area in the lunchroom was like, you know, you go eat lunch and then because there's another, because the school's so overpopulated, there's another class coming in. And so while that class is coming in, you are in the spill out area, cause, but the, the, the teachers still need their hour lunch. So you your lunch is 45 minutes. You eat, and then for 15 minutes, you're in this, like, pen outside, unless it rains, uh, waiting for your teacher to come pick you up. Now, for me, this was one of those dangerous areas because that's where the kids would beat you up. Um, fun fun times in Miami. But having people were like, well, why were they all standing there with no supervision? I was like, oh, because the spill-out area. And they are like, spill-out, I don't. I don't, I don't. And, I, and again, it's something that when you have to explain it, right, or go to another city with a school that doesn't have it, it's hard to film, right? And so I, I say all that to say that if we don't keep cutting back the mangrove or at least parting it back away, you know what I mean? You don't want to cut it down. You need it for like, because it, it keeps the land together, um, literally. Um, and it's true. It's, it's, so, it's, you know what I'm saying? See, that's the weird shit that we can't, I can't explain to you. Literally, there's these mangroves and they hold the land together. Like, that's how we can make South Beach. Like, if you've ever been to Miami, you've had a good time on South Beach, you need to thank a mangrove because mangroves literally hold earth in the salt water so that you could build more earth on top of it so that those islands can connect and make a Miami beach, right? So tell Puffy that. And, um, not because he doesn't know, but like, I think he'd be interested. So, like, thank, 
I, I do. I think he'd be interested. Um, and so, like, you know, there's, like, man, you know, that, th- literally, that kind of, like, idiosyncratic thought and understanding of, like, the place, the ground you stand on is important to to artists and filmmakers and to make some and to make someone have to leave that and then tell other stories and learn those other places and learn those stones and learn, you know, learn the geology of that place, I think can be a disadvantage. And how do we use the advantage of what you know in the city? So it, the only way to do that is like Andrew's saying, is like making a path or platform for those artists to engage. Um, and we try to do that as often we, as we can, I think. I, I try to do that and I know Andrew tries to do that. And sometimes we together try to do that because we're Libras. <laughs> and uh, in terms of like, as we were saying before, the micro budget, you have to do, you have to make a film with what you have, right? Um, the one thing that's fascinating about Moonlight is that from every department, from DP, James, who's one of the amazing DP, like, and the cast, it doesn't feel that way. Like, it feels like, like, for my question, I guess, is like, micro budgets, your reach are very limited in terms of like a cast that you can get or a DP that you can get. But, it didn't seem like that limited moonlight or your other way. So how, 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 how do you get the best I'll people sp- to collaborate I'll with you? I'll speak to, to – I think there are two things. First is I'd like to separate the uh, micro budget and sort of where Moonlight was because mm-hmm. uh, the micro budget has – I've, 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 before Moonlight, Barry did a movie called Medicine for Melancholy. It was a $13,000 micro budget feature. Mm-hmm. For me, micro budget is everything under 50, and we've had this no, conversation. No, yeah, and I think but, that's fair. But um, – and the a philosophy for micro budget is you don't need those things. Just make the movie. And like, oh, if I just get this actress, like, no, you take the person who's standing there and just make the movie. Um, but that's the same attitude where where the Moonlight team, Barry, Adela, James, like the core team that we all came from this tradition of just like, well, let's just put our friends together, the people who are doing things, who have been doing things long enough to be good at them. Um, but the, to answer the question, like, how did it not feel that way? One, because Barry's very good at what he does. Yes. Two, the we were a very small boat, and we caught a couple of very big fish, right. which made right. it challenging on the production end uh, to to hold together the thing. Like a lot of it was held together on thin ice. Um, well, it always is. Yeah, I mean every production is always. So it just Barry's really good at working with the environment he has and sculpting it to feel intentional. Uh, there's a shot in the movie where Andre Holland uh, turns and, and blows smoke into the lens, and it's like a really beautiful, uh, like sensual moment. That moment happened. The camera was being put away, but James hadn't fully uh, dismantled the camera and Andre was outside and it looked good and Barry was quick let's get this moment and you know we didn't have an AD we didn't clap we didn't do any of the things that you're supposed to do in production but Barry knew to be fluid and his team knew to be fluid right. so they were responsive to a moment and captured a thing that made it into the cut um, simply because Barry comes from a tradition where um, the rest of the apparatus is is kind of a bonus but also kind of like wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have it I could just make the movie well, also, you again, you mentioned the thing that I think is so important for all of you, and um, and this is hard because I I don't have a lot of them, but I but the ones I do are really amazing. What about your friends? TLC told us to ask the question, like, what, <laughs> fam? What about your friends who are standing around, <laughs> who like like there are some you have some folks in your in your corner with you who are like the thing, and so you know, um, just for example, uh, Mahershala. Uh, was supposed to be in one of my plays back in California, like 10 to, tw- 10 to 12 years prior to Moonlight, right? And Andre Holland and I had been had actually met at Sundance at the theater at the theater um, uh, lab, and worked together and ha- and hadn't stopped working together up until Moonlight, right? Like you get like, and arguably Andre is like one of the best actors of our generation. Like you 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 cultivate friendships in the work. And gaining the, and bringing them into the work is a part of what you do. It's like that's a part of micro budgeting. It's going, hey, you know, you know, and I know, I can't. Like I've, told, you know, how many times I've dragged Andrew into something. Like, look, I can't pay you. Actually, Wait, the way the way he says dragged, <laughs> I have to point out. In my life, there's one career truth: is when Terrell calls, you just cancel whatever you're doing and say yes. Like my good, my life advice is just when he calls, say yes. That's that's it. But but at the same time, <laughs> there are moments. But I then will I then will be like, I don't, I can't. Like you, your work lo- like the amount you're about to work <laughs> to the amount I'm got I'm gonna be able to put the, money in your hand and the, maybe um, even feed you is like low. But I will take you to Puerto Sagua. We will get some chicken <laughs> and like I will also find some way to like make sure your you know your flights are at least paid for. You know what I mean? Like, um, well here, so here's a good 
good training uh, or experience for like the, the attitude is that uh, one of those phone calls I got from Terrell was about an experimental outdoor theater piece. Mm. And um, which filmed so much. No, no, no. And such a good film. Like, have you seen it? No, I have it. Oh. Well, Watch look it. At that. it looks so good. But the th- that was my first experience doing uh, all of those things, right? Experimental live theater. Like, I'd never done any of that. Um, and this was a particularly strange uh, kind of project because it involved incorporating the landscape and the physical architecture of a building and timing it so that people could show up at whenever they wanted to. There was no curtain, and so we had to build a little system. Um, and but you have to be fluid to the rain, to the moment, to the crowd. To, you have to be responsive to what's happening. And that fluidity, that ability to to adapt um, and keep your eye on the larger prize is is what theater is about. I mean, I was just at uh, – Terrell just had a, a play open on Broadway, um, and it's amazing, called Choir Boy. And um, just watching, even, even at that level, you're on Broadway, but even at that level, things are happening that force you to adjust to the moment. The actors have to – uh, to be completely present, but also adaptable and flexible. And if you can somehow bring that into filmmaking, which is by nature the most rigid, like scheduled thing, if you can bring in that fluidity, I think you will make something interesting. Um, yeah, I do think my life in theater makes makes me a little bit of an outlier in that way. Because <laughs> I'm often, I mean, people are annoyed constantly about when I'm like, okay, but just keep the camera rolling for a second. Hey. Look at just look at the camera. Just look at it. Cool, cool. And people are like, "That's millions of dollars." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're gonna love that shot when we get it." <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And I think, and I think, you know, I so some some of the traditions of the theater to be rough and ready. I mean, we uh, the person we just worked with, Teo Castellanos, to make a short fi- his short film. Um, we uh, he taught me theater when I was 15 or 16. We would do live street theater, and you have to look at the people who are sitting around. Look at the people who are falling asleep. Look at the people who are annoyed. Look at, and like bring them into what you're doing and go, okay, do I clap now? Do I go, hey, you know, whatever I'm going to do in order to keep that live fluidity happening. Well, it actually is very similar on film because there are moments that you're sitting watching a scene going, people are going to fall asleep when they watch that scene. How do I, <laughs> like in the five seconds that I got to get this, because somebody's going to tell me I got to rap for the night or the, you know, we were shooting minor so they can only be on set for so long. How can I get something of the dyna- dynamism of this scene to pop and the camera catch it and we go home? Like, and, and to have a crew and a team that is also about that life, because if they're not about that life, if your DP's not about that life, if your grip's not about that life, if they're not about that, like, oh, cool. Throw the light this way. Oh, I got an idea. Turn this light off. Oh, I know something. Here, we'll just put this over. Oh, I got it. If, you're, if your wardrobe isn't like, cool, I can just turn this shirt around like this. We got it. It's cool. Let's go. Like, if they're not about that life either, you are, yes, wasting money, one, but also not getting the thing that is fluid and necessary in terms of, like, uh, in terms of the art, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think, I mean, one the things that we, the things I would hear about, about Barry being like, Cool. Just throw the camera around this way. And James being like, already there. Cool, cool. They don't even talk to each other. I mean, if you're not in that, in that, in that, that and again, I say that to, to I go back to what about your friends? Because if you if you and that person have a language already, then the camera the camera's moving before you say it. The the grip is putting the light up before you say it, right? And that will save you money, yes, but also save you time. And time is actually the thing that is if we want to talk about micro budget. We gotta talk about time. <laughs> right. The um, I I worked with another filmmaker named Amy Simetz, um, and Amy has this really interesting philosophy because Amy and I did a movie called Sun Don't Shine, which was um, shot in Tampa, and it's a forty thousand dollar micro budget feature. Um, but one of the things Amy's rule was she only brought other her crew were other filmmakers. They weren't a sound guy. The sound guy was also directing. The the you know the costumes were also writing. She she brought people who who understood the process not from their job. Uh, and, and the narrow position of like, well, it's more convenient for me as a sound person. They said, okay, what does a project need? I understand how to make projects. And she's a great example of someone who looks to her friends. Who have I worked with? Who has this mentality? And then basically cast her crew for sensibility, not necessarily skill or talent. Um, they all had that, but her priority was do they get the vibe? Do they understand how to, how to be fluid in this moment? And it meant she could cede a lot of control uh, to, the, to the person doing the thing because – you know what we're after, and I picked you, so that was my choice. I don't have to command um, uh, your behavior or your action. Do this thing for me now. It was like we're fluidly moving in a direction, and it, it felt 
uh, honestly, Yada was the same way on Third Trinity. There's this this um, cohesion that comes along when you trust your collaborators, and that's not a thing. If you're looking for money to to solve that problem, you will never solve that problem. Mm-hmm. You solve that problem by picking the right people, by cultivating friendships over 15 years, mm-hmm. finding people who think the way you do, and just work. And that seems to be the the proper takeaway for what micro budget stuff is, and that can graduate to a project like Moonlight, which had that fluidity and had that cohesion because everyone came up from that same attitude. And when you guys uh, think about micro budget, is there a certain? Do you ever stop to think, like, okay, what, like, so this story fits well for a micro budget, but like, it, like, you know, you have that amount of money. Do you ever try to reverse engineer it and be like, okay? Like what? What? What kind of story works for the? For uh, let me rephrase this. What kind of story do you think lends better towards micro budget than obviously you know you can't make a big, big action film, but like, or you can. Well, so like, how? I I actually don't know that the budget has anything to do uh, with the type of story you can tell. It certainly determines how you can tell it. Like if you were trying to mimic expensive looks, that costs money. If you want to do four takes of a thing and then pay for a real car to explode, like, all right, like that costs a lot of money. Like you can't fake it, you can't fake expensive. Um, but this is a, a good Borscht story. Lucas did this once. So the first time I was ever uh, at Sundance with with a short, I was a, a producer on called The Life and Freaky Times of Uncle Luke. And uh, there's a moment in this script where the Turkey Point um, power plant in Miami explodes, and the script says power plant explodes. And uh, when Lucas, as a director, was talking about this moment, he was like, other people read it, and they were like, well, that's very expensive. And he says, no, it's not. And then they took a piece of paper, they drew Turkey Point Power Plant, and then put a firework, and then had a construction paper turn red, like, pow. 68 cents? (laughs) Um, The movie looks different. It doesn't look like an expensive movie, and that's why it played these festivals. That's why people recognize it. They're like, wow, I didn't know you could do that. Normally, I would have, like bought a power plant and exploded it for $30 million. <laughs> and it, it's like, you can do anything you want with it. You just stop stop pretending you have to do it the way that money does it. Do it the way that tells your story, because that's ultimately the only thing that matters. Yeah, I mean, it's the, again, goes back to philosophy that, that Andrew certainly has in this filmmaking, which is inside out or outside in. Like, And, and often he, he goes from the inside out. What at the core is your storytelling? And, you know, it, again, you, you, you find who you're working with. I mean, if you've got a bunch of friends who know stunt and are good actors, you, you'd you be surprised at when you put the camera on what they can hide in terms of an action film. Let's say you wanted to make a movie about martial arts and you got like less than 50 and you can't do, you know, again, you don't want to CGI anybody. But it, we I remember in high school at New World, we had a friend, I had a friend who knew Kung Fu and we just filmed him running up over a car and like, it, it was amazing, but all we and it was a terrible camera at that. But he just knew how to do it, and so again, it's about when people come to the table with knowledge and access and ability. Um, that is, you you know, you if that is a part of your story, you don't have to look at the budget to to determine how that story will be told. Now, again, you're absolutely right. If you are trying to mimic um, what some of the larger studios do in their expensive, the things that they spend lots of money, yeah, you have to pay your FX guy to, to rotoscope the thing out mm-hmm. and put the thing like. Yeah, <laughs> that does cost a lot of money. If, but is that, but then ask yourself, is this fifty thousand dollar movie that I'm or under movie that I'm trying to make about that moment? Is it is it about mimicking that, or am I just trying to teach myself how to do it? Because if that's the case, then it's like cool. You just want to learn that technique. But if the story isn't about that thing, let her go. There's there's a filmmaker I really love, um, a Spanish filmmaker named Nacho uh, Vigalando, mm. and he did a movie uh, about an alien invasion of Madrid. And um, there's a moment in the movie where the, the characters are trapped in the apartment. They re- there's a spaceship over the city. And the only time you see the spaceship, he looks out the window. And he goes, oh, my God, there's a spaceship out there. And then he sets up a video camera, plugs it into the TV. And on the TV, you see what he sees out the window, which is a very poorly rendered um, corner of a spaceship between the buildings. So he only had to, had to fill, like, this much. And it's, it's a crappy visual effect, but filtered through the camera, filtered through the TV. So he was able to not pay a lot of money and then he puts it the tv next to the wall and then on the wall draws the rest of the spaceship and it's the character doing the math saying well if it spins like this then it must be this big and that's and then he does the math but he didn't have to pay for a visual effect he found a way to cheat it and the movie's more interesting because of that because then it's about how the guy does the math and it turns out you learn about the character turns out he can calculate the circumference of a thing based on the speed of this of the of the rotation and 
it, it also costs like four dollars, which is the best thing about that movie. So you watch him as a filmmaker, and you go, "This is a guy who knows how to solve problems." Uh, and I feel like that's the most important mm. thing. You're we're all creative people, right? You're all filmmakers. You're all problem solvers. Mm -hmm. So when you put a problem you can't solve, I just need two hundred million. Do you have two hundred million? No. Well, <laughs> solve that problem another way then. Do you need to? The great thing about being a writer or a filmmaker is that you can write a different scene. Mad true. Lord knows, I will just. I'm good at being like. I remember one time Barry tried. Like one time somebody asked Barry about a question, asked me a question, and then a, a, about something Barry did, and it, it annoyed Barry because you could tell the person was trying to like get us to be upset at each other or like just call some. Just wanted us to like wanted something to print. Like wanted to be like, yeah, there's derision in the moonlight. And I was like, nah, it was totally. It, uh, Anyway, so me being the the Slytherin I am, um, I was like, I was. They were like, well, what what's different in script? I was like, well, there's one part of the of the script that's different than what I wrote, uh, than what I originally wrote, and um, it's better for it. And they were like, are you saying that? What was it? But so I go on to describe the scene how it was before, and and I still to this day think it's better. But again, Barry turns to me. He goes, yeah, man, that day this and this was happening. I was like, are you kidding me? I don't care what happened, like, you did the thing, you know what I mean? At that moment, you solved the problem and made the film better. Who the hell knows what if what, what I wrote would have been great? Like, who cares? Like, what you got was the, and if you, and again, you can be, you can be a siloed writer and be like, no, you didn't write my words. Fuck that. You, what you created was art, and you got to the heart of what I was after, and that's all I care about. At the end of the day, I mean, even sometimes on stage, some of the actors will be like, oh, I messed up that line. I was like, that, who cares? You, del you know what I mean? Like, you, it, you went after the thing we were all after, and that's, and that's it. That's what, we, that's what we ask for. I have a, a very specific filmmaking example. Uh, it's another short, it's a short I did with Amy Simons, this one from Sun and Shine. And we were shooting in Miami, and we had, I don't know, $5,000 or something to make the movie. And we'd set all the days up, and I'd organize, you know, I'd spend every dollar properly, and, and, um, and a day before we're supposed to film, a hurricane uh, arrives. And I call Amy, and I'm like, Amy, I don't think we should make the movie. There's going to be a hurricane. She's like, listen, we're both from Florida. We're just going to wing it. I don't want to – it gets super inconvenient. So she says, look, I'm just going to write a couple versions of the script depending on weather. So if it's raining, if it's uh, – you know, the flight gets canceled, we won't get the actor, fine. We'll, we'll just change it. And it was a lesson in, one, being incredibly fast on your feet. Two, she wasn't married to anything but what the story was about. So the best example of this is I'd spent, um, as a producer, I'd spent a lot of time trying to organize a supermarket because she f decided to write in the scene where the um, character goes and buys supplies for the hurricane that's going to come. And we realized we can get a lot of production value if we lean into this, so we're going to do that. So to get into a supermarket takes a lot of effort, but I managed to get us one. And on the day we're supposed to film that scene, um, the storm is, you know, there's a, a lull in the storm and we can drive there. And Amy says, listen, it's gonna, we're going to lose like an hour and a half just getting there and coming back. Um, I can accomplish the exact same goal to show that the character is mentally not where she needs to be and that she shopped for supplies if we just get a bag from the grocery store and have her open the trunk of her car. We saved three hours. We didn't have to go to the supermarket. We didn't have to follow through all, all the paperwork that I was going to have to do to, to like sign off. And she got the scene. It took 12 minutes. We didn't leave the yard. That was a, that's a filmmaker who understands what her story is about and what actually matters, and everything else is superficial. Like, she's not fixated on the color of the car because metaphorically it really implies, like, the virginity of whatever. No. I just need the character to show up in a space because that's what a movie is. And it's nice to have that kind of control over a movie, but that requires money. Uh, and if you are trying to make that kind of movie, you're not trying to make a micro-budget film. You're not coming inside out. You're coming outside in. Um, so that was my example. Questions, comments, gifts of cash? <laughs> back and talk a little bit more about that circumstance in Moonlight where the hurricane was coming and the sharks are in the water. I mean, <laughs> I'm very curious how you overcame the scenario because I don't know what you had planned to shoot or how you had to modify it to capture what you got for the... the um... Well, it was a longer time in the water. So, for example, so again, again, the, 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 and again, the folks on the ground can tell you more, but what you what what they were battling was time. The storm wasn't there, but when you when you're usually on the shore, you can see when you can see how long you got, and there's enough black in the sky. You know what's happening, so you know how much time you've got between now and then. So, any and all of you who have put a camera on and turned on the light know just how much time you've got by the time 
once that camera starts going, once the, the light hits, how much time you've actually got to do it. So this truncated their time immensely. So the lines that were there, there were tons of lines about like learning how to swim and like the, the there was there was an action that needed to happen and, and, and then there was a preparation that needed to happen. Alex didn't know how to swim. So <laughs> Barry was like, get in the water and teach him how to swim, which is what the scene was about. And so at the end of the day, am I am I making no, uh, uh, yeah? So am, and so James get in the water, put the camera on the kid learning how to swim, and and that and again that moment translates in in a way that you know because you're watching the real thing happen, right? You're literally watching someone begin to learn how to tread water for the first time, um, and I think for me for me was again someone was trying to make it about what was the words on the page, but the scene was always about that. It was about someone taking this kid under their wing and showing him something he had, he couldn't do before and that he could if he just tried. It, it also, I think, the fact that James was able so, uh, to so quickly move and Barry was so quickly uh, able to adapt and sort of let go of what he had planned mm -hmm. and just be fluid with the moment and, and understand this is what he had. He didn't have the opportunity to go and come back a second day and so we'll, we'll shoot indoors where it's covered in the rain, won't bother us, we'll come back on Thursdays. Like, we didn't have that opportunity because we didn't have the, the resources for it. But Barry didn't need that because he was comfortable – knowing when he could let go and when he couldn't. He knew what he needed to get out of the scene and said, I can get that in the time I have. Um, and that goes back to choosing your collaborators. He worked with James so that he has that fluidity. He can say, hey, remember that thing, that time we did the thing? Let's do that again. Uh, and being able to fly by the seat of your pants while still maintaining... Uh, um, the integrity of the film, yeah. Is, is, I think, the biggest lesson of, of that kind of that style of filmmaking. No, no. It was intended to be in the water, but not in the way that you see it. Right, so the, the camera person was always supposed to be in the water, as, and if I'm telling the story right, we I think we told it a lot, so I think I got it right. But you know, the the camera was meant to be in the water, but again, you know, Barry Barry wanted to get them from a, the water's perspective and them coming into the water and how the water went. Instead, he had to get two actors who were already in the water, so that scene could have could have easily gone south, right? If he didn't have a camera person who was like, no, I know how much just to be outside of the water to get them both in, because you could totally lose Alex. You could, you know, what I mean, in terms of because water, the chop is changing. There's a storm off, off, so the shore is taking. I mean, easily could have, but a person who knows the water enough knows what the shot needs to needs to be. That information and them flying again, being fluid enough to just focus on what they need got them the ability to do it. But again, like you like you're saying, it's 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 not everything isn't up for grabs, but enough is. And you have to you have to go with what do we know? Collectively what information do we have to get what we need done? I'm curious to know like how long did it take you to from writing to having the film done? Like did it take such a long time or did you actually plan other projects in between? Cuz I'm I'm a I'm a filmmaker just like you guys who make films under ten thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. I always like post oh this project's not gonna work this time. Put it back. So do you have that kind of process when you're writing projects? I'm just curious to know. Yeah, projects projects ma uh, maturate at different times. I mean, Moonlight, from the time I wrote that script to the time that Barry... I mean, Barry's rewrite uh, or rewrite and adaptation of In Moonlight took uh, three weeks, 10 days, something like that. But then the shoot was like 25 right. days. The, the date I remember the date I remember on the original, on the script uh, Terrell gave me was 2006. Right. The Oscars were 2017. That long. And before that, in 2003, is when I, when I wrote this, the first version of that script. community and place and not just how you might capture your place, but how you um, how you get the community of the place involved in that filmmaking. Well, yes, I can actually. I've uh, uh, mm -hmm. all right. We don't have enough time. Um, one thing I think sports teams uh, do a really good job of being about a city and people rally around the city. And uh, they rally around the team. And you know, if you're from Miami, you root for the Dolphins, whether they're winning or losing. Um, and they have a way of, of building community. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I root for them, but that's. Good. I, I honestly uh, am not a sports person, which is why pick the. Another team. Pick another team. Pick another team. I, whatever. The point of the story is that you pick your team, and and it helps you uh, com connect to your place. And our our operating idea was that you could pick, um, you could do that with film. 
is that you could build us, you could tell stories that are about the city. Not one movie. Moonlight isn't supposed to be the definitive Miami movie. It's supposed to be one in a bunch of Miami movies. So you build community by talking about a place, uh, the thing you all share. So whether it's the love of the sports team or it's the love of the city. The city's easy because everyone has it. You live there so you can rally around um, your, your memories of it, the things you loved about it, the things you like, you like to do. And that is inclusive in a way that, um, that other things aren't. Like the, the umbrella that we grew up in Miami connects the Miami people in this room. Um, and the first thing you ask is like, you know, where'd you go to high school? How long have you been in Miami? Oh, who do you know? You need, do you know my cousin? Uh, and if you can say all those things, you're connected beyond the, the other superficial differences between. Um, so lean into the bigger picture and I think you invite people in. Are you from Miami? Are you from Denver? Are you making movies in Denver? Well, then, then come here because we do that too. Uh, and that allows you to, to sort of ignore certain barriers uh, and find a common cause. With uh, the South Florida losing its film in some, I know there's a lot of people, a lot of people, I myself, from South Florida and my team, uh, we left as a result. Mm -hmm. How's that impact? I mean, for 12 years of making products in Miami, we never qualified for any incentives. Our things were way too small. Same. Same. I mean, and even when we did Moonlight, where there was no incentive there. So, And as we shoot television right now, and tried to vote for a governor that may have put it back, and hopefully this governor somehow works with the legislation to do that. We 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 receive no incentive, at, uh, even in shooting the the television I'm shooting television show now. So, uh, and again, all you do is try to get those folks who have somehow maintained a sort of stake in this in the state. Um, they're very grateful. We try, and I try to aim everything back there. I mean, but we had to fight again. We had to. I I, I won't. I won't lie to you. We had to fight with you know the studio and the network to to film in Florida, even though the story set in Florida. They were like, "Oh, we can find some places," and I was like, "You, you just there is no adjacents. We got to go down there." But not just because of um, not just because of landscape, right? I meant there's an authenticity of people um, and of and of and of overlay of culture that I was like, "We're going to it's going to be really expensive trying to find X, and that's going to make you know." But it it is difficult. It's hard. It's really difficult, and I, I again, we we've never qualified for it in the in the in the the projects we've done. I think we've done three or four projects together. We've never qualified for it. Well, the the I feel like the the incentive and the industry conversation is very different than the micro budget and the community conversation, mm -hmm. and um, I I almost feel like incentives are it's a it's a whole different game that involves so many so much more apparatus, and it's not a incentives are not about. Um, seeding a community and growing uh, a self-sustaining ecosystem. And this is where we disagree in that I think the incentives can maintain an industry which allows for those who are seeking to do micro budget to have a day job in the industry that they you know what I mean like if you're if you're if you're if you do wardrobe if you do grip if you you can do that during this day but if you have an off day and you want to create a mic you you want to do what you feel and create what you want in your spare time you're able to do it um, and I think one of the things that that made impossible for us um, one of the restri restrictives um, behind that is that it took a lot of friends away. Again, it makes it like those friends who have that in information and ability to work on a show that, like you know, um, you know, a lot of friends worked on Dexter, and they were there or or worked on Ballers and or whatever it was. And while they were working there, they could also come in and be like, yeah, sure, I'll shadow or whatever you need for these three days that you're making this micro budget film or this micro budget project. Or cause sometimes you don't even shoot a pro shoot a film. You shoot like. You just shoot, you know, you just sit around and you can't do that when people are like, nah, I got to move to Atlanta because I, I can work there. Right. And, and they're miserable. I have lots of friends who are like, I'm miserable doing the, just the industry for other folk and not being able to do the fun things that I used to do and just grab my camera and go out and film, you know, a sunset or something. But I, this, we slightly disagree in this because I do think that, that, that incentives like that from, that help the industry maintain also help those moments where uh, it's again it's about, it's what I talked about with all those teachers retiring at that moment right it they they have an ability to have a job to be there to educate and 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 contribute to the community in a way does that make sense um, but we we can't debate what we don't have right right well my, like there there are people in this very room who are better suited to to talk about the incentive in Florida and the efforts to bring it sure. back um, sure but I think my overall feeling is like. There's some things you can control and some things you can't. Mm -hmm. And th the the micro budget idea is if you can't control it, 
you don't have it. It's not a, it's, if there's no solution, it's not a problem. It's just a feature. It's just a thing. Um, and that's, that's just a separate conversation. Yep. I hear that. Yes. When you're moving from uh, a live performance medium to then something where the, the way we understand it is through is distributed widely um, and also based on captured uh, time and post-production construction of the story, does that like change your approach throughout? Like, how does that connect or, or maybe completely differs for you? In terms of micro budgeting, no, in or terms in terms of, just of like process, because I think it's really relevant either way if we're figuring out like how to use what is at our disposal as far as um, locations. I mean, again, what's what's really interesting is that we've worked on a number of things, and we have a, a, a common interest in uh, and love for director Yara Chavieso, who just did a piece that is exactly like you're saying, like is site specific, but also film and also dance and also live performance, but also multimedia. Like it, these things are happening in the now and. And we, and of course, the interest is to look at the story and see what will benefit it best, right? And in that moment, she thought, I, I want to tell this Madea and have multi, you know, live performance happening, live band happening, but also very much captured and processed work. Um, and then we asked her to do another project where, you know, it was, it was, it was much more of a, what we would call a, reg a regimented film shoot. You film... You have this many days to film. You have this much in the can. You now need to send it to the process. You have to mix. You have color. Um, but each each one of those, when we talked to her, was about what does that story need in that you know what it, what's the how do you want that story to touch and contact the audience? Um, and so for me, that's that's the first thing I ask. I go, will the audience experience this in a more immediate way live or sitting down somewhere with their phone? Can like what comes across in the stream from that? And that and that's the question you have to ask the piece. You have to ask, what is your strongest suit? How are you gonna come out swinging, right? You you never want to undercut the power of a thing because you because of the budget, but also because you because you're in one media. You always want to engage in in its most powerful form. Sometimes that's live. Sometimes it's captured. I'm being told to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I actually just watched one night in my school studies class last week, and I was told that the group of boys that's playing with Chiron um, in the field is actually just a random fifth grade class from Florida. So I was wondering... Plus or minus random. Yeah, okay. random. Like, last the question. Um, I was just wondering, kind of back to the aspect of, of community, how many actors or characters in the film were just residents, not necessarily actors? And how that process <laughs> the first kind of voice you hear... Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I'll, I'll, the, I mean, it's... If you hadn't seen them in another in another movie, if they weren't Mahershala, Naomi Harris, Jadal uh Andre Holland, uh, Trevante Rhodes, they were Miami people. Uh, and well, Ashton and Jarrell. Ashton and Jarrell flown in, but uh, okay. So the the core cast, um, everyone else was was from the neighborhood. In some cases, like we were filming, and a kid down the street was there, and we're like, "Hey, you should probably be the guy over here." Um, but a lot of that goes uh, credit goes to a woman named Monica Sorrell, who. Um, was my background casting person on that. She was the one who went into the, the elementary school and was like, hey, you guys play football? You want to be in a movie? And she's actually one of the first filmmakers, uh, of the two filmmakers who won the micro-budget filmmaker residency. She's one of the first. Um, and she's someone who understands the, the world and culture, and that's sort of a good example of how um, we're trying to keep the path open to people who understand and, and can be a part of that. But she was the one who went into the community, found people, and said, we're going to make a movie. It's, it's going to be great. You should really be a part of it. The, the print... Sorry. The principal in the film also is uh, t uh, uh, Tanisha, and uh, okay. I was going to jump in and talk about how much she's great, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, talk about how much she's great. So uh, Tanisha Seidel is uh, actually also an alum of New World School of the Arts, the same high school, uh, although I don't think you overlapped with her. Mm -mm. I, none of us overlapped. It was just one of the things you discover. But she runs a theater program. Um, at a middle school. At a middle school, and and one is an incredible theater teacher. Two has an incredible students, and we went to her, and she's the one who gave us both uh, Alex and Kevin. I'm sorry, um, Alex and Jaden, um, who played Kevin. Who played Kevin, and um, she was like, "Hey, I've got all these students. I think they like these are the kids you're looking for." So we went through her class, and she was on set coaching, and then she was available to uh, to be in that role. So 
we tried to bring in the community as much as possible. The community that helped us make the film, the community that I mean, the, even the teacher uh, Edson Jean, who played mm-hmm. Mr. Pierce, the teacher in the in the high school act. Um, Edson was a friend of mine who'd gone to New World, but the college version, not the high school. And he um, had been helping us read actors. Uh, and like I wanted him involved in the movie. We didn't have any money for him. I needed this thing, so I brought him in, and Barry eventually saw him was like, hey, this kid's great. Why aren't you in the movie? And then he was in the movie. So that kind of um, fluidity happens when you're out in the swamp making a movie for $6, uh, and we just tried to keep that spirit going. Great. All right. That's a great way to end. Thank you all.